MedCram.com. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Roger Schwelt from MedCram. Today we're going to tell you how to absolutely crush jet lag. And we're gonna do it primarily with understanding when to expose your eyes to bright light and doing it with melatonin and without any prescription medications. So to understand how this is gonna work, I have to explain a little bit about how the circadian rhythm works and why we get jet lag in the first place. I'm recording this here in the summer of 2023, and according to the news reports, travel is going to be up 55% in Europe this travel season. And I can imagine a lot of those flights are going to be going from New York to London, from Los Angeles to Paris, things of that nature. And as we'll talk about, a lot of jet lag occurs when people go from west to east. Eastward travel is where you're going to particularly get a lot of jet lag, and we'll explain why that's the case. Let's start with the circadian rhythm. Things that happen in the human body are timed very specifically around the clock at certain times of the day. For instance, when you get up in the morning, this is when you have your sharpest rise in blood pressure, then likely to have a bowel movement at around 8.30 or so. Highest alertness is around 10 o'clock, best coordination around 2.30 in the afternoon. And the list goes on and on. Now, normally, this is timed with light exposure. So this is all timed based on when light is coming into your eyes and when the body knows that it's daylight and when it's night. And so there are many cues from our environment that tell us what time of day it is. Sometimes we're eating, and that can be something that leads into the timing of the circadian rhythm. And the master clock, which is in our brain in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it gets its cues from all over the environment, but the thing that is the most effective at making change is light. And that's why we're going to talk a lot about light. Light is something called a Zeitgeber. A Zeitgeber is any external or environmental cue that entrains or synchronizes an organism's biological rhythms, usually occurring naturally and serving to entrain to the Earth's 24-hour light, dark, and 12-month cycles. In other words, light tells you whether it's day, and lack of light tells your body that it's night. And that's the most powerful Zeitgeber, is light. And so as you can see, depending on where you are on the planet at any one given time, it can be day or night. But it's never, obviously, all day at the same time or all night. So depending on where you are, you're going to be on a different cycle. And that's just because the Earth is round and it spins in one direction from west to east. Looking at it another way, you can see the map of the world here, and at certain times it is dark, and in other places at the very same time it is daylight. And we can see here this is the leading edge of the nighttime. This is where the sun is setting, and here we can see where the sun is rising. And so to put it more succinctly, what we have here on the top is what's going inside our brain. It's our circadian rhythm. There are certain things that are happening during the night. There are certain things that are happening during the day and again for the next night. If that is in synchronization with what is happening externally, then everything is going to be just fine. We are going to want to sleep when it's dark, and we're going to want to eat and play and be active when it's daytime. So everything's perfectly fine before you get on that plane and travel east or west, because your circadian rhythm, which is right here, is in perfect alignment with what is happening externally. Light is a Zeitgeber, which means that it can entrain and move the circadian rhythm if it's necessary. If we look at the morning time, which is right here, this is when you wake up in the morning. If you were to expose your eyes to bright light at that time, what would happen is the circadian rhythm in your brain would advance. In other words, it would come on earlier during the day. And the reason is when there is light around the edges of the daytime portion of your circadian rhythm, your brain believes that it might be a little bit off, and so it tries to incorporate that light into the new circadian rhythm. You'll actually see an advancement or a movement of that circadian rhythm in this type of a direction. So that's advancing the circadian rhythm. We'll notice that the circadian rhythm is moving to the left, which means that everything is happening earlier in the cycle. Let's reset that and go back. For that to actually occur, not only do you have to have bright light in the morning, but you also have to make sure that you're not exposing your eyes to bright light in the evening. Because if you expose your eyes to bright light in the evening, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to shift it to the right, or in this case, delay it. So in the situation where you have bright light in the morning and no bright light in the evening, the overall shift of that circadian rhythm, if we ever wanted to move it, 
hint, hint, is going to be moving to the left, which means that we're advancing it, which means that everything that our brain is doing, it's happening earlier in the day. There's one other Zeitgeber that is also pretty powerful, and that's the Zeitgeber of melatonin, which is produced by the pineal gland. Giving melatonin in the evening, right here, has the opposite effect of light. Light actually shuts down the production of melatonin from the pineal gland. If you were to take melatonin at this particular time of the evening, it would also have the effect of advancing or moving to the left your circadian rhythm. What are the three things that we must do to advance the circadian rhythm? We must expose our eyes to bright light at the beginning of the daytime portion of our circadian rhythm. We need to avoid light towards the end of the day of our circadian rhythm. And we could also add some melatonin at around that time. And all three of those things working together would certainly advance the circadian rhythm in the correct direction, which in this case would be to the left. However, let us say that we wanted to move the circadian rhythm in the other direction. Let's say we wanted to delay it, to move it to the right. Well, we certainly would not want to have any sort of light in the morning time. And we would also want to have light exposure, and that could be through computers, laptops, or even going out into the sun itself, any sort of light towards the end of the daytime portion of our circadian rhythm right here at this time. So light here, but not here, would cause the opposite thing to happen. It would cause the circadian rhythm to become delayed. That means the things that were happening in the circadian rhythm would now be happening later. All of those things that would normally be happening at particular times would start to happen at later and later times. Let's use this example of getting on the plane in Los Angeles, California, and traveling to London, England. That's about an eight-hour transmeridian travel, so that means we're traveling from one time zone to another. That's an eight-hour difference, even though the plane ride takes about 11 hours, 12 hours, somewhere in there, depending on connecting flights. It's eight hours time difference from Los Angeles to London, and specifically, you're going ahead eight hours. In other words, London is eight hours ahead of Los Angeles. That's what happens whenever you do eastward travel. And as we'll see here, eastward travel seems to be the most problematic when it comes to jet lag. And so that's where a lot of studies have been done. So here we are in Los Angeles. We're about to get on the plane, and we are perfectly timed because we've been living in Los Angeles for a long period of time. The night portions of the circadian rhythm is lined up with night externally. The daytime portions of our circadian rhythm are lined up with daytime externally. But we get on that plane, and we travel all the way to London, and we get off the plane in London, and what's happened? Our circadian rhythm is still in the same rhythm. It's not going to change. It's very difficult to change. It can only change maybe one or two hours at most in a given day or so. What's happened, if we wanted to represent that here when we get off the plane in London, is that the clock has shifted a full eight hours. Notice that whereas this used to be lined up with 6 a.m., it's now lined up with 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's been a eight-hour shift. Things that were normally happening at 6 o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles are now happening at 2 o'clock in London. And that's actually at the same time. It's just that now we're at 2 o'clock in London. And let's just go ahead and fill in the rest. This is where we are now. We have traveled eastward. We are now in London, England. Our circadian rhythm has not much changed, but this is the new clock. This is the new external experience that we're now dealing with. What do we do to now get, once again, our circadian rhythm synchronized with where we are in London, England? And because we've traveled ahead in time, we're also going to want to advance our circadian rhythm because that's the easiest way to go. If we, for instance, travel to India, which would be a full 12 and a half hours difference from Los Angeles, then it wouldn't really matter. We could fall back 11 and a half hours or go forward 12 and a half hours, and it would be about the same. But since we've gone ahead eight hours, it's going to be better for us to advance our circadian rhythm. Now, we've already talked about what it was that we needed to do to advance our circadian rhythm. We needed to have light exposure at the early portion of the daytime portion of our circadian rhythm, and we needed to avoid light towards the end of the day. So this used to be at around 6 o'clock in the morning, and this used to be at around 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock p.m. But because the clock has changed, now sun exposure is really going to want to be happening at around 1 to 2 o'clock p.m. in London. And you're going to be wanting to make sure that you're not exposing your eyes to any kind of bright light starting at around 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. This is the way that we're going to actually get our circadian rhythm in our brain faster advanced so that it catches up to where we are in London. 
we're going to want to make sure that we're exposing our eyes to bright light at around 1 to 2 p.m. That's not going to be a problem. All you need to do is go outside in London at 1 to 2 o'clock p.m. and make sure you're getting bright exposure in your eyes. The key, though, is making sure that you're not getting too much exposure at 6 o'clock in the morning. And by the way, these things have about a six-hour window. Starting from there, going six hours. Starting from here, going about six hours. So essentially, what's happening here is it's not a good idea to be exposing your eyes to bright light when you get to London from 6 o'clock in the morning all the way to about 12 noon. If you expose your eyes to bright light at this time of the circadian rhythm, it's actually going to have the effect of delaying your circadian rhythm. As you're trying to catch up in London, if you're exposing your eyes to bright light at their time at around 6 o'clock in the morning till about 12 noon, up to this point here, you're actually going to have a harder time catching up to London time. So many times when you get on that flight in Los Angeles, for instance, at 5, 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a long flight, it's about 10 or 11, 12 hours, and so somewhere usually over the Atlantic Ocean, while it's about 6.30 in the morning and you've got another 3 or 4 or 5 hours to get into London, the flight attendants come by, they turn on the lights in the cabin, they tell you to open the windows, and they feed you breakfast at 6.30 in the morning. And what does that have the effect of? <laughs> It has the effect of essentially, according to your circadian rhythm, you're getting bright light at around 10 p.m., your time. Essentially, what happens then is your circadian rhythm starts to become delayed at the time precisely that you don't want it delayed. You want it advanced. So what do I recommend to travelers who are doing this? This is when you get to travel like a movie star, a VIP. Put those glasses on. You always want to follow the directions of the flight attendants on the flights. You don't want to get into trouble. But what I'd recommend is at those times, starting at around 6 o'clock in the morning until noon, I would definitely wear sunshades and have dark glasses to make sure that you're not getting too much light exposure. And then at around 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, that's when you want to take them off and get bright light exposure to make sure that you're getting that because that is going to help advance your circadian rhythm so that it catches up with reality. The other thing that I think is really helpful is melatonin. And we're gonna talk about melatonin here in just a second. But first, this is what it looks like. It's 10 o'clock in Los Angeles. It's six o'clock in London. And you look at your watch, because if you already set your watch to London time, Greenwich Mean Time, and the flight attendant says, open up your windows, good morning, let's have breakfast. And they're already trying to get you on schedule for London. But in fact, what they've done is sidestep this, and they're actually working on delaying your circadian rhythm. So do what I would do and make sure you get a good pair of sunglasses as this lady has here, as they're opening up the windows at 6.30 in the morning. Let's talk about melatonin. We said that melatonin is a great way of advancing your circadian rhythm, especially if you take it right before bedtime. So this is a paper that was published way back in 1986, and it was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, so really good, high quality. They only had to use 17 healthy volunteers, and they got statistical significance. And what they did was they took healthy volunteers that were originally living in London, they flew them out to San Francisco, and they had them stay there for a couple of weeks, so they got accustomed. And then they flew them back to London. And as we'll see, the biggest problem with jet lag is flying eastward. So they took a flight, in this case, from San Francisco to London. Again, that's an eight-hour time flight difference. Notice what they did here. Three days prior to travel, so while they were still in San Francisco, on San Francisco time at 6 p.m., they gave them melatonin 5 milligrams versus placebo. And they did that for three days prior to taking off. Then they arrived in London, and for another four additional days, to make it a total of seven days, they took melatonin again versus placebo, but instead of taking it at 6 p.m. in the evening, they took it at 10 to midnight. And you can imagine why that is, is because they are going to feel like they're going to be going to bed much later in the evening because of the time difference. And so what they're trying to do here is speed up that advancement. They actually didn't do anything with light at all, but as you can see, light does work very well. Here, they're just looking at placebo versus melatonin. Then, seven days after arrival to London, they gave them a chart that looks like this here on the right. And they said, on a scale of zero to 100, depending on how you feel your jet lag symptoms, how do you feel? How bad was it seven days out? And so you can see here, this is the placebo group here, and this is the subjects taking melatonin just right off the bat. You can see there's a dramatic difference, and it was statistically significant. But what they use as the criteria is 50%. So notice that one, two, three, four, five, six subjects out of nine had significant enough symptoms to say that they actually had jet lag. 
whereas nobody in the melatonin group had any symptoms of jet lag seven days out. That's pretty remarkable. And again, statistically significant. This is one of the things that I highly recommend. Melatonin is over the counter. It doesn't require a prescription, at least in the United States. However, I would definitely make sure that if you buy it, you buy it from a brand that has a third party laboratory that confirms that there is actually melatonin in that capsule because it is not regulated by the FDA. A couple of more things about melatonin. Make sure that it is not timed release. You want immediate release melatonin. And further studies have shown that it really doesn't matter what the dose is. Anything from 0.5 to 5 milligrams are similarly effective. This was published in another paper. They say here also that the timing of the melatonin dose is important if it's taken at the wrong time, like early in the day. It's liable to cause sleepiness and delay adaptation to the local time. Who should not take melatonin? They do mention here that the effects of melatonin in people with epilepsy and a possible interaction with warfarin needs further investigation. I'm not sure if after this was published in 2002, there's been further trials looking at that, but it's something that you may want to discuss with your doctor. We've talked about traveling from Los Angeles to London. What about if we look at westward travel? And you'll see here why westward travel is not as problematic. First of all, your circadian rhythm is actually a little bit longer than 24 hours, and so the normal situation is for you to delay anyway in the first place. But let's take a look at it here. So we've got westward travel. If we have westward travel, that means that our external clock is going to be delayed, and so let's delay that. It gets pushed back, as you can see here, by about eight hours, and we'll put in the other day here. We've got the circadian rhythm, and the circadian rhythm has to now also be delayed if it wants to line up with what is going on externally. So we're going westward travel here. In the westward direction, we want to delay the circadian rhythm, and things that delay the circadian rhythm are going to be where we do not expose our eyes to bright light in our our circadian morning, and we do expose our eyes to bright light in our circadian evening. Now notice that this is exactly the situation as it turns out anyway, because notice here that where we are, nighttime is here exactly when we shouldn't be getting light, and daytime is here exactly when we should be getting light. And so things are naturally set up for you when you travel westward to not have much of an issue with jet lag. Let's take a look here. If we're traveling eastward, the goal is to advance the circadian rhythm. And if the number of time zones equals X, then I would expose bright light for six hours starting at six o'clock in the morning plus whatever X is. So if this is an eight hour time zone shift, eight hours to six to eight o'clock in the morning would be two to four o'clock in the afternoon and generally more towards two o'clock. And avoid bright light for six hours starting at eight to 9 p.m. plus, in this case, eight hours. So that would be around six o'clock in the morning for six hours until noon. Now remember, you could also take melatonin at six o'clock in the evening for three days prior to travel, and melatonin at 10 to midnight for four days after arriving eastward. And then what I would recommend doing is after each night, reduce X by one to two, because after each night, your circadian rhythm is starting to catch up and go to where your final destination is. And so those numbers can be ramped down. Now for westward travel, it usually takes care of itself, but if you wanna get technical about it, the goal here is to delay circadian rhythm. And so if the number of time zones is X, again, exposed to bright light for six hours, start at eight to 10 p.m. minus X. So if this were eight hours, we would go around noon, which is exactly when you're gonna be exposing your eyes to bright light anyway, and avoiding bright light for six hours starting in the morning at six to 8 a.m. minus X. So if this is eight hours, then you're gonna be making sure that you're avoiding bright light at midnight, which is pretty easy to do if you're going along with the natural course of things. And again, make sure that you reduce X by one to two. I hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe, turn on notifications and join us at medcram.com where we have continuing medical education lectures in sleep medicine, sleep apnea, insomnia, and also how to optimize health and immunity. Thanks for joining us.